Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. I want to welcome to the show Burke Kearns, who is an award-winning television and motion picture director, producer, writer, journalist, and author. He is also the author of the 1999 television memoir and expose, Tabloid Baby, and the show won't go on, the most, the most shocking, bizarre, and historic deaths of performers on stage. The acclaimed book he wrote with Jeff Abraham was published in September 2019 by Chicago Review Press. And today we're talking about his latest book, which I have here, which is so, so good. Lawrence Tierney, Hollywood, Hollywood's real life tough guy, which just came out. Bert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. And I just received the hardcover yesterday. So oh, fantastic. Ready to go. My second book. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a read. Uh, I, I, it's such an, a, a roller coaster ride. And I know that, that you, you uh, expressed this with other people who have interviewed you that, you know, and I had a similar experience because you, you start reading it and things are suddenly looking good. And then boom, he gets, he gets arrested again. He, things are looking good. He gets arrested again. It's such an up and down. Um, it's a real emotional <laughs> book in a lot of ways, but also very, a lot of it, I couldn't help but laugh. I mean, I was felt guilty <laughs> sometimes because I know it's not always so funny, uh, but some of these stories are, are so, so wild. So I absolutely loved it. Well, well done. Thank you. Yes, it's much wilder than anything that someone can, could write in a screenplay. You know, for people who, don't, who aren't familiar, if you're not familiar with Lawrence Tierney, he was an actor, a, a handsome Irish American out of Brooklyn, New York, who came to Hollywood in 1943. Uh, he became an overnight sensation in 1945, playing the gangster John Dillinger in the film Dillinger. And then over about the next seven years, he proceeded to fight and brawl and drink his way out of a career. Or so it seemed. He's, he managed to continue mixing movies, fights, drunken scenes, more movies later, some television appearances uh, throughout the next co couple of decades until in the 1980s, he made an incredible comeback really as an entirely different actor, an old craggy bald headed guy who with a, with a gravelly voice and a little bit crazy. And he was on every television drama of the 1980s. And then he was rediscovered by Quentin Tarantino in the film Reservoir Dogs. Um, most people will remember him as uh, Joe Cabot in Reservoir Dogs or as Elaine's father in Seinfeld. He had, he had right. a famous actor in Seinfeld. Yeah. Almost had a recurring role, but he blew that one as well. Oh, that's another that's another great story. <laughs> there's so there's so many. I'm sure we could share a few. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask off the top because I know that you accidentally came across the newspaper article about all these arrests that he had been arrested, you know, 13 times or so when you were researching another book and then you started researching the book from there. But uh, what what is it that that makes you say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to go all the way and and write a book on on Lawrence Tierney. What what gives you the 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 go ahead for something like that? First of all, we both entered Hollywood through the same door, literally on Gower Street. I think it was 825 Gower Street. That building was the entrance to RKO Radio Pictures when uh, Tierney first was was hired as a contract player. That building remains and was the entrance to Paramount Pictures when I arrived there in 1990, uh, working for a television show on the Paramount lot, which had incorporated the old RKO Studios lot. I also drank with Tierney one night in about 1992, <laughs> shortly after Reservoir Dogs came out. Uh, there are a lot of bars and restaurants in Hollywood that were big in the 1940s, are still around today. And now, you know, in, in the 1990s, when I went there in the early 90s, a place called the Formosa Cafe, an old Cantonese restaurant where Ava Gardner used to have a booth and Elvis used to be there and Bogart. And now you, you would go there and you'd see these old guys at the bar. But then over there in, in a booth is Tim Burton or Keanu Reeves. And so it was a mix of the old and new Hollywood. I was sitting at the bar by myself one night. I look over and there's an old guy with short sleeves drinking a whiskey. And I said, I recognize that. That's the guy from Reservoir Dogs. And he turned around. And he said, hey, how you doing? I'm Larry. Nice to meet you. And shook hands. <laughs> and I don't remember what we talked about. I know we had some drinks. We had some laughs with Lindy, the old bartender. 
and there were no fights and no brawls. That was the, that was the thing I didn't remember. <laughs> so, I, I, so I had that little personal connection to it. And But it was when I found that story that said, Lawrence Tierney arrested for the 13th time, that I looked into it and saw that, that it wasn't the 13th time, it was like the 22nd time. And I said, this is a very interesting story. And I started the research, the pandemic hit, the lockdown hit, I had a lot of time to sit and just research stories and look up everything I could about Lawrence Tierney. And I was surprised really every step of the way. It was really mm. an untold story of the underside of Hollywood and the dark side of fame, really. Absolutely. I, I actually remember uh, an acting teacher of mine years ago told me that he met him as well. So I, I emailed him the other day. I said, did you did you once tell me that you you knew Lawrence Tierney? And he was the manager of uh, the movie theater inside Car at Carnegie Hall. And um, apparently Tierney came in all the time and he even coached him on some auditions. And he was said he was one of the nicest guys, you know, which is interesting because as you said, you know, you point out in the book, he could be really charming and sweet and nice, but if he was drinking, it it just it just was, you know, it was another story, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, which... and the sad. I was gonna say the sad part about that was through the fifties, you know, when he drank, when he got in fights, he obviously had mental issues, he had yeah. family issues, he you know he he was an alcoholic, and he would admit he would say. I'm an alcoholic. I've tried AA and it doesn't work. It's really got the better of me. Um, but the media, the gossips of the at the time, whether he was in the movies or not, loved him as a regular in the columns. And it was always Dillinger acting up again, you know, Lawrence Tierney trying to play that mean character that he plays in the, on, on, in the films. And right. they let him down. The medical establishment really let him down. And the justice system let him down through the 50s. There are so many stories where Tierney is hauled in before a judge. He's still sleeping off whatever drunken fight he got in the night before. And the judge looks at his record and says, Mr. Tierney, this is the fourth time you've been brought before me. The same thing over and over again. It is time for you to go to jail. But if you promise never to drink again, I'll let you off on probation. How's that? Your Honor, I promise <laughs> I'll never drink. That happened on that 13th arrest. Yeah. And sure enough, he goes off and he might white knuckle it. He might white knuckle it for a few months and then he falls again. So it, right. you know, it, it was that story. What also made it great, I don't mean to go on, what made it different than the usual, you know, rags to riches, Hollywood, Babylon in the gutter story was that Tierney was an incredibly talented actor. He mm. was really good. He didn't really get a chance to, shoot, to flex his acting muscles in the movies because he was typecast as the bad guy, you know, the, the, the film noir bad guy because there was nobody colder and meaner than Tierney. But, but he was also very funny. And that was another oh, thing yeah. too. He, he got to show that in the 80s on television, how funny he yes. was. Yes, absolutely. Even even in uh, Reservoir Dogs, he's hilarious. And I, I, I'm not the biggest Tarantino fan. I do like Reservoir Dogs. But he does have dialogue that just stays with you. And I can remember so many of the lines and you can hear Tierney's voice just doing, uh, you know, when he gives everyone the colors, you're Mr. You're Mr. Pink, you're Mr. Blonde. I mean, it's so it's it's just so good. I mean, he he just <laughs> he played that part uh, so, so well. Was there was there any indication to how he responded to hearing all these stories in the press did he did that drive him crazy that he was always in the press Had, i don't know if anything you found anything about how he reacted to all this well it, it it came to a point where it seemed he started playing the role a bit he kind of realized you know he realized that it didn't matter if he stopped drinking he'd, he'd go into for some reason he would continue to go into nightclubs even though it was you know they would always be shown drinking a milk in a nightclub uh, or right. whatever but it got to the point where he would, he'd go to the club and say, I'm not drinking. I'm sorry, we can't let you into the club. You're going to cause trouble. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not drinking. And then he'd be like, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. Nobody believes me when I'm not drinking. So I might, I might as well just drink again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he got to the point where he, he did, he fell pretty precipitously. He was homeless for a while, living on the streets of New York. You know, he, he had to escape to Europe. He went to Europe for about seven years and wound up coming back, you know, worked construction. I think one reason why he showed up at Carnegie Hall a lot was that he was driving a handsome carriage. He was a horse and buggy driver in Central Park. So he <laughs> That's right. in the neighborhood. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. But he always he always managed to keep going. He always managed yes. to keep himself afloat. And there was always somebody willing to get him, a, give him a job. That was another thing in the book where it's this, you mentioned to me, I think in, in an email that it was, or in a, in a post that it was a roller coaster ride. You'd get to the point where Lawrence Tierney is, you know, in a fight with cops. He's beaten to a pulp. He's oh, in front yeah. of the cameras, bloodied and beaten, and he's hogtied. And that's the end of Lawrence Tierney, except yeah. guess what? He gets another role the next week. Because yes. People liked him. He was a nice guy. Well, that's what's so that's what's so incredible about the story is that it's tragic on the one sense, but there's something so inspiring about it because you think, how did this guy survive? How did he keep working? Uh, not just as an actor, but like all the different jobs that you mentioned, construction, uh, handsome cab driver. How did he even survive some of these hits to the head? I mean, some of the photos you have here um at the back in the back of the book where he's you know he's a bloody mess after getting after getting uh, i'll just share this one after getting hit with uh the uh, the billy clubs i mean my god i mean some you know it's it's it is it is quite impressive that he was able to reinvent himself and and survive and keep working and it's it is it is really an incredible story i don't see it as totally tragic i see i don't know how you feel about uh, about him in general but I, I i think there is a lot of there is a lot that's inspiring up to it well that's that's one thing i say it's a tragic story but in some ways it's really heroic for sure because to do that and when you look at it it's a career that spanned seven decades i think i said it was 69 films more than 30 uh, television appearances and more than 75 arrests i mean but it, it, it did last into the 21st century beginning in the right. 1940s and the other thing you know he died in 2002 but what makes this really a current story is that when again when he came back to hollywood and kind of restarted his career in around 1985 he started going back to those bars and one of the bars is a place called bordner's it's an it's an old bar right off hollywood boulevard right down the road from the chinese theater and that's where he ran into a guy named Jeff Burr, a guy named C. Courtney Joyner, a guy named Will Houston. Uh, Jeff Burr is, is a director. C. Courtney Joyner is a screenwriter and a writer. Will Houston is an actor. They were all getting started then. And they recognized Lawrence Tierney. Look, that's, mm -hmm. one, that's Lawrence Tierney. Get him over. And they, next thing you know, Lawrence Tierney is at their table. Next thing you know, they're <laughs> in his apartment. Next thing you know, he's sleeping on their couch. And all these youngsters, he hung out with the youngsters because they would, most of his contemporaries were, growing up they'd either you know put that life aside and got married and had kids or whatever so he was hanging out with with the, with the youngsters and he was old larry with the crazy you know, oh the old crazy guy and telling them great stories um yeah and so you've got guys today scott uh, alexander and larry karaszewski the great screenwriters and producers they did ed wood the people versus oj simpson series they did man on the moon and etc uh when they were first starting writing their first scripts lawrence tierney was the next door neighbor to Larry Karaszewski, and he would burst in on their screenwriting sessions and perform for them. And so these guys were influenced by Lawrence Tierney. They're, they're, one of the problems I had in the book was that so many people were getting in touch with me with their Lawrence Tierney stories. Everybody <laughs> run into the guy and had a great memorable time with him, which is which yes. made the book a lot more fun. Oh no, absolutely. They what one thing I was one thing I was curious about was, you know, because you mentioned that he some of the some of the plays he got cast in, he he got he would get fired from like uh, Sanford Meisner, the great acting teacher, thought he was drunk at a rehearsal and, and he was fired. But he, he seemed to manage to never get fired on film and television. And, and I mean, I could be wrong, but when I'm when I'm reading this book, it's like, how did he manage to not drink or could he just handle it better when he was at, when he was on a film or television show? I don't, I don't know if you had any ideas about that or, or any, was there any evidence about how he managed to not get fired? <laughs> yeah, well, th there were, you know, I basically did a week by week, you know, chronological, you know, research of, of his life and career, everything that, that was printed about him and everything that, you know, like right. in public records, et cetera. And there were times when he went up to a year without drinking really right He'd go months without drinking you know he would white knuckle it he would he relied on prayer he relied on, on whatever he could to not drink so that he, he was able to handle it he caused some trouble while he was 
working, but he claimed that he never drank while he was uh, making right. the film. I think the Broadway, you know, he had, he wanted to go on Broadway. He had two or three chances, blew them all. And I think part of that had to do with the discipline it would take to show up every day, you know, yeah, six days a week, you know, twice on Wednesdays and do these shows. He 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 performed in a lot of plays in what they call the straw hat circuit, I guess, summer stock outside right. of New York. He did Brando's role in A Streetcar Named Desire. Mm -hmm. He went off, went crazy. He did um, <laughs> Humphrey Bogart's role in The Petrified Forest. Mm -hmm. He did mm -hmm. Tracy's role in the last. And in all of these the reviews that you saw out of town, they were like, this guy is great. I mean, he yeah. is really a really good actor. So he, you know, he, he could have he could have done any of that. Yes. No, I, 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 I don't doubt it at all. Did, did, you know, you, you talked about some of the training he had as an actor, but was, was there anything that uh, was, was there, was there any proof about how he approached acting or was he from like, was he Stanislavski trained? Did he, was he method actor or, or how did he, did he have a system? I don't know if anyone found anything out about that. No, he just he was one of just these naturalistic actors. He looked good. He was he was he was a, a model in the Sears catalogs and he, he was he was a lifeguard when he was first discovered. Um, but he worked with with the the, the Black Friars Theater an, an Irish theater group, very naturalistic group out of uh, that was just off Broadway. Uh, he worked with them a bit. He worked with the, the New Rochelle Players, which is sort of an amateur group and just got into Hollywood. And right. he, he sort of relied on his you can see when he's when in, in these films, the way he approaches them is that he's just sort of himself, this big, scary guy being as scary as he possibly could. Yeah. I mean, he was, when you go look at his films from the, from the forties, I mean, he was always so realistic uh, where, whereas, you know, so, sometimes in the classic Hollywood period, sometimes the acting could be a little broader than perhaps it became in the fifties and sixties, but he was always, so natural, so I couldn't help but wonder, uh, you know, did he, did he, was he from the method training or, or something? But I guess he just learned on the job. I mean, he must have been just so instinctive um, that he could just be so relaxed on on the camera because it it really is uh, spectacular spectacular to see him uh, when he was young. And and I, I I couldn't help but wonder if did he, you know, he he did say, well, you know, they're always cast me as the tough guys. Did uh, did, did that bother him? Did, did he hope to be more like Cagney and and not get uh, typecast into the uh, into the gangster tough guy parts? Or did he just take whatever came? He always said, I, I take whatever comes. I act in what they cast me in. Yeah. But from the beginning, he resented it. His character of Steve Morgan in in the movie Born to Kill, which is, you know, again, one of the most coldest evil Oh yeah, impersonations of of a of a, of a cold hearted killer, uh, and his probably his most effective role. He hated that. He said, "I hate the That's character. Right. It's not me. I want to. I'm funny. I want. I, I want to play other roles, but they won't let me. And I don't want people <laughs> right. to think that I that I'm him. Well, people thought that he was him. Yeah, right. People would approach him. I mean, that was a that was one of his issues was that he would again spend a lot of time in bars, a lot of time in nightclubs. And he'd be at a bar and someone would come up to him and say, hey, Dillinger, you're not so tough, are you? Right. Pop, and he punched the guy. And it, <laughs> and it was used to a lot of, they called them one punchers in those days because that's all it took from Tierney. A guy would wise off, yeah. Tierney would pop him in the nose. Every once in a while, he'd pick a fight or be in a fight with the wrong guy. Like oh, a, yes. a former middleweight collegiate boxing champion. <laughs> and then he'd get his head handed to him. <laughs> You know, I, I was watching, uh, and I know you've seen it, the the interview in the mid '80s with uh, Skippy Low, which you could find, <laughs> which you could find on YouTube. And I, I knew he was a big guy, but and he was enormous. He was sitting beside that uh, I, oh, I can't remember the the female actor. He was beside there, and right, right. just the the contrast between the two of them. He was he was enormous. I mean, his his fists. Uh, oh my God! I mean, I wouldn't want to. I would not have wanted to have gone into a fight with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, M Michael Madsen, the actor who was in um, Reservoir Dogs, who's really one of the successors to Tierney as far as tough guy actors go. He's, yeah. you know, Tierney threw a punch or two at him once and he said, you know, with those, he just missed my chin. He said, and with that, that's right. bad hand, it, it would have hurt. <laughs> oh, God. I was I was laughing out loud at the, the story where he was trying to g give his uh, lawn furniture away. <laughs> to uh, Chris Penn <laughs> and then, and then, and then tried to give it to Michael Matson, And then 
and then brought it back to Chris Penn. Oh my God. I was, I was at a coffee shop the other day and I was read on that chapter and I was laughing out loud. <laughs> I had to, I had to hide my, uh, hide my laughter not to bother anyone. I even, I even had some looks from people when they, when they, when they saw this mug on the cover, sort of like, <laughs> who the hell is that? <laughs> I couldn't help. But I, I just, my reading of how they, um, how they were uh, looked at it that looked at the cover of this book is there any favorite uh, tyranny films of yours what which ones do you like the best uh, well my favorites are are um the devil thumbs a ride which i, I just found yesterday out yesterday from eddie muller the the noir czar the film noir expert right. that it's not released in this country because warner brothers doesn't own the underlying literary rights to the film so after all oh. these years they're, they're not showing it here i I got a, a a DVD on eBay from England, actually, so I guess I, I can't show it here. Um, the Devil Thumbs a Ride is great, and there's a film that he made early in his career before before uh, Dillinger called The Ghost Ship. It's a supporting mm. role. He's not even um, he's, he's not even mentioned in the credits, but in it he's he plays a ship hand on this on this boat where the captain's going crazy, and he's funny. He, 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 he's, he's great. He really stands out. He has an, uh, an unbelievable death scene that you can find on YouTube where he's crushed. Oh, is that where the chains, chains. Where, he, where he gets chains, uh, yeah. buried in chains? Yeah. Yeah. He's great in that. Yeah. Then, but then also, I think some of his best work was done on television in the 1980s. Uh, he had the last words in the final episode of Hill Street Blues. Right. He had a recurring role on that in the last two seasons. Uh, and to, uh, that's an honor. You know, the, one of the most... Uh, one, one of the most definitive series of the 1980s, and here he gets the, the last words in it, and that was mm. an honor for people who made the made that. There's a great, uh, there's an old show called Tales from the Dark Side. Uh, he plays an exorcist with Phyllis Diller as his wife, and it's like it's a comedy, and it's <laughs> they're hilarious. So there's, there's a lot of good Lord, Lawrence Tierney out there. Did you? I, I imagine you. You did you want to while you were doing the book? Did you want to see every? everything he was in did you were you able to get everything he was in was that something you you tried to do yes for the for the most part i did you know i'm, I'm not a, a film i love movies i love i love films i'm not a film expert i'm not a film noir expert although now i've been just watching film noirs left and right i'm, I'm basically <laughs> a journalist you know and, and, I, right. and I, come from, I come from journalism and and telling true <clears throat> stories and it was it was tyranny's story that really got me and then along the way yeah I, I found these films you know i found after he was basically banished from from the mainstream in hollywood he did some independent films one of them was called female jungle it went through a, a number of oh yeah of incarnations before it became female jungle i found that 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 out and it was jane mansfield's first film mm -hmm. uh, they weren't able to release it for a few years until she appeared on broadway and became a star and they managed to get it released but in that film he plays a cop who gets so drunk that when he wakes up the next morning, there's a murder and he can't remember if he did the murder or not. So I was like, Oh, that's very, right. very tyranny esque. That was, that was the one. <laughs> there's, there's yeah, a lot was, of little, little small films that are out there. Yeah. I, I was gonna, I was planning to see that uh, soon because uh, I hadn't heard of it, but one, one film that I was really impressed with him was uh, the hoodlum. Uh, I thought he yeah. was incredible in that, uh, that scene with him and his mother towards the end where she tears into him and calls him garbage. And, and, and you see, I was breaking his heart. His mother is, I mean, he was, he just, wow, that was a, a powerful, powerful scene that, that I hadn't heard of it uh, until I read the yeah. book, but and that, that's, and that's uh, a, I really like that one. And that's a film that also kind of brings out the pressures that Tierney was under when it came to his family. Uh, you know, Tierney had, was established in Hollywood and his younger brother, Gerard, got out of the Navy, came to Hollywood. And while Tierney was making Born to Kill, uh, Gerard came and visited the set and got a screen test and became right. an actor on his own. Well, of course, <laughs> as people said, you know, you've got to change your name from Tierney, we think, because it's not really, you know, Lawrence has that great reputation. So he became the actor Scott Brady. And Scott Brady had a, a great career. He, uh, it culminated at the end. He was in the movie The China Syndrome, and, and he played the old corrupt sheriff in, in Gremlins. But he, That's he, right. he did lots of stuff through through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, but the Hoodlum uh, featured Tierney's youngest brother, Ed Edward right. Tierney, 
and, and Lawrence got him the job because he came to Hollywood. I think he was fought in Korea or came out of that war. When he got to mm -hmm. Hollywood, Lawrence got him a job in a, in the film there. Uh, right. Ed Tierney wasn't as into being an actor, stick with it as much as the other two did. Right. I wanted to touch on his family a little bit because something that, that you pointed out was that he had a daughter and, and his uh, younger brother uh, took, uh, brought the daughter up and then, and then mar married the woman who, was, who Tierney got pregnant, which is, yeah, yeah. you know, quite a, quite, a wild, quite a wild story. But there, there was something that, uh, you, that you, you mentioned in the book that he said, you know, hey, if I just had a family to go home to, maybe I wouldn't be going to these bars so much. So was there, was there any suggestion or anything to indicate why that, that relationship with that woman didn't work out or were his, were his troubles just far too deep to have a family? I think that his troubles were deep when he found out that th that this woman was pregnant. It was like, whoops, you know, you're on your own. I don't think he could he could handle that. I don't right. think he could handle the pressures of, of running a family by that by that point in, in his life. I mean, we talk about, you know, the beatings that he took. I thinking later that there was a chance he may have, you know, had CTE like these football players have. Right. You know, when he was older. Um, a lot of the guys told me that he'd go up to women and say, you know, rub my head, you know, and, 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 and massage his head. And they all thought that that was, uh, was a harmless old guy. Why not do that? But I, I interviewed a woman with, with, with whom Tierney lived. He lived with her family when he, when he showed up in New York back in the fifties. And when she was a teenager and, and he would say, can you rub my head? I got these really bad headaches. And she, as a teenager, Said, well, he's probably got them because of the drinking and, and all the beatings that he takes. And yeah. He a lot of billy clubs and, and, and boots to the head by cops in the 50s. Oh, God. Yes. Yes. I mean, like, like I said, you know, I'd either be laughing at some of these fights or some of them were just really scary, particularly the ones with the uh, police officers, two on one. Uh, and, you know, again, you look at the back of the book and the photos show uh, the damage. Uh, one, th one thing I always ask writers who, who write biographies, it's kind of a funny question, but when you are researching a guy like Tierney and talking to all these people he knew and his family, uh, d does he ever come to you in your dreams or anything? Or do you ever feel his presence sending you, sending you any messages? <laughs> Well, you really, you, you can't help that really. You can't really yeah. help but feel that as, as you're writing a book like that and getting so deep into, into it because, you, you know, you start feeling like a bit of a responsibility for the person. You know, there's some stories that can't be confirmed and you don't want to print those. I mean, that there was the legend that he was involved in a, in a, in a car crash in uh, Spain sometime in the 1960s. He borrowed a car from Steve Reeves, who right. known as and Hercules crashed the car, killed a hooker, went to jail for four years. I heard this <laughs> from so many people. And I right. had to say, look, I'm really sorry. But again, I've done this month, month, week to week, you know, scan of this guy's life. There never was a four year period where he was off the radar, maybe right. a year, maybe six months. And if he had been arrested for manslaughter or murder with a prostitute in Spain, the news definitely would have gotten yeah. over to the States. It would have made a, a big deal. But still, people uh, that I, I spoke to then say, nah, we think something did happen. I spoke to Steve Reeves' biographer, and who was a friend of his, and he said, no, he never mentioned Lawrence Tierney ever, but maybe Steve Reeves was keeping it secret. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Well, then there's also that that story about the, the woman who who he was with who, jump, who jumped out the window and 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 died. And then there was a, a, a possibility there that 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 a pimp did it and then Tierney went and either killed this pimp or some beat him up or got his justice as he put it. I mean, that's quite, that's quite crazy. I mean, Oh my God, how did he get into these, into these situations? And at this point, you know, he, I think he was, he was in his mid fifties and he was taking, getting a few roles here and there. He was living in New York city. It was 1975. He was living in New York city and I believe working construction. No, he was working as a handsome cab driver at the time. Mm -hmm. and in, this old guy is in an apartment with a 24 year old woman in a nightgown they're drinking and as far as he tells she just says i'm going to go out the window and went out the window right now, what really happened i mean everyone i speak to and you know he was never charged the police you know believed his story there was no evidence that he that he threw her out the window but these stories have have, have come out and tyranny was always very i spoke to a lot of people who tr broached the subject with him. And he was always very skittish about saying exactly what happened. But 
you know, basically if, to him, it, it was a tragedy. He knew the girl, he loved her. And there is that possibility mm -hmm. that something mm -hmm. happened and he got the justice. Right. Well, that, what, what was even scarier about that was that I know you, you pointed this out in the book is that there was a similar scene in the hoodlum where the, the woman that he gets pregnant jumps off the jumps off the roof, his sister-in-law. And yeah. I thought, wow, you know, art imitating life and vice versa. Do you have a, um, a favorite Tierney story? I know some people ask you that, but is there a favorite story or two of, from, the, from the book? Or is it hard to nail down? <laughs> there, there are so many. The, the, the one story that, that, that strikes me is because I, I pass the place a lot because uh, I live where, where I live is um, the incident at St. Monica's Church. Uh, this is the church that was this, the, this inspiration for the movie Going My Way with Barry Fitzgerald and Bing Crosby. They played priests. Uh, this church in Santa Monica in, I think it was around 1951, uh, police are called there. There is a barefoot, as they called in the time, a bum uh, hanging around outside the church. When police arrive, the bum runs into the church and tries to take sanctuary at the altar. Well, it's Lawrence Tierney, and he's, <laughs> in, he's it's an alcoholic breakdown. He's he's gone, right. you know, mentally ill as far as as people think. And um, the police, I want to arrest him, and he's saying, "I have sanctuary. You can't arrest me." And the cops don't know, so they go to the priest and say, "They people really have sanctuary in a church where we can't arrest them?" And they're like, "No, you." get him out of here please we have morning mass <laughs> uh, and they they had to get some makeshift uh straight they made a makeshift straight jacket brought him into the police station it was very sad he was screaming that they're out to kill me like they killed robert walker that robert walker the actor had right. died just recently was doctor had given him a, a, a fatal dose accidentally uh, right i think in help hope is of, of helping his alcoholism mm -hmm. um so tyranny is uh sent to a sanitarium, he's sent to a mental institution or a mental hospital. And the, the critics, the, the gossips write him off. What a sad ending. We knew this was going to happen. We're never going to hear from Tierney again. Thank God he didn't kill someone else. That's the, let's close the book on the story of Lawrence Tierney and move on. Right. Three weeks later, there's a barefoot <laughs> guy in a bar wanting to whip anybody in the house. It's Lawrence Tierney. He's arrested again. He wasn't charged for the church incident. This time he's charged. He's dragged in front of the judge. It's his 13th arrest. And the judge says, Mr. Tierney, if you promise not to drink again, oh my God. I'll yeah. on probation. And the story continues. And so there you go. I mean, there's, there's, there's are so many of them. There's the Battle of Decker's Lawn. There's the Battle of Weehawken. There's the Battle of Sixth Avenue and 53rd Street. They're all battles that Tierney you know, was involved in. But there is one thing that someone mentioned to me, and I like to mention this, is that there's a lot of stories of tyranny breaking down doors of women's apartments mm, in mm. search of someone. Tyranny beat up a lot of men, but he never he never laid hands on a woman. And that was That's the right. thing about tyranny. Yeah. There, was a, there, there was a reason why he was able to, you know, romance and was faced by women like Gloria Vanderbilt and socialites mm. and actors like Shelley Winters because he was very charming. He could speak several languages. He was very intelligent. He could recite right. yeah. Shakespeare and poetry. And he was a very sensitive guy. And he did treat women with great respect. There's a, a woman named Julie Davis, who she's a director. She met Tierney very early in her, her career. Uh, she saw him at Cantor's Delicatessen, a place in Hollywood where a lot of showbiz people hang out. And she recognized him and went over to him and said, Lawrence Tierney, I, uh, I love you. And he's like, oh, you saw me in Reservoir Dogs? And she's like, no, in Born to Kill. I loved you in Born to Kill. <laughs> I'm making a short film. Would you be in it? And he's like, sure, here's my number. And he actually appeared in her short film. That's and amazing she's in the book. that he would do and that. She talks, and she, she said, it's amazing that he would do that. And he was so nice <laughs> and so avuncular. And she said, thank God I didn't run into Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, God. <laughs> thank God. Thank God for that. Would you, uh, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, because, you know, the press made such a mockery out of his problems and, you know, felt, you know, just would say he was weak and things like that. Obviously, people didn't understand the depths of alcoholism as much back then. But I, I couldn't help but wonder, I just, I was curious, your opinion, I, I wonder if he, if that would really be treated any differently now. Do you, do you think the press, you know, these stories would, would still be uh, similar in the way they're, they were reported today? No, Hollywood was smaller then. You know, the world, the world was, was smaller than the media was more concentrated then. Uh, We've had people like that, you know, the, the Andy Dix. I mean, remember Sean Penn used to get in a lot of trouble. Johnny yeah. Depp got, got in trouble. Kanye West, 
you're, right. you're talking about people who are off their meds. Yes. Um, you know, would it, would it be treated the same? It probably wouldn't be treated the same because his problems would probably have been treated. He probably would have been on some sort of medication or they would have dealt with his issues much differently than they did in the, in the 1940s and 50s, which was mm -hmm. basically, you know, if he was stronger, he'd be able, yeah. if he was wasn't such a weak person, he'd be able to stop drinking. And then he'd say, I can't, I can't do it. I'm, I yeah. try. And so, you know, it, it, it was a sad story, but again, they said somewhat heroic in the fact that he did keep going and he managed, you know, he, he wreaked havoc on his family. That was why, you know, his, his nephew, who was Ed Tierney's son, Tim Tierney, helped me a lot, uh, gave me that side of the story. When I talked to people who knew Tierney when they were younger, it was, wow, Larry, wow, he was the great guy from the old days. Tim told me the other side of the story, the damage right. that he did to the family. And that helped create a, a more rounded picture of, of the man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's so odd that these judges would just say, oh, if you promise not to drink again, then, you know, we'll, we'll put you on probation. I mean, it, you know, because it, it's because AA was around then. So you, you would think that at, at least the justice system would have some kind of understanding that, that it's not going to be that simple. I mean, that's, that's very bizarre to me that they would just keep putting a Band-Aid on his problems like that. But did, yeah, do you think even on the justice side, they were ignorant? Oh, most definitely. And and yeah. the, the press, there will there, there, there be articles going, we can't believe it. This We thought this was the end for Tierney. The judge just right. let him off. And right. at the time, I think it's controversial, but I think that, you know, AA let him down in a way because, you know, and he, he proselytized for AA to the end. When he was an old man living on the near the Venice boardwalk, he'd go up to, to pour down and out guys and lead them to the AA meeting. You know, mm -hmm. he really, you know, he really cared for, for, the, for the down and out. But in the 40s and 50s, or in the 50s, when he was part of AA, and he had been sentenced to AA a couple of times, the idea that, first of all, it was you know, a moral failing that led to the alcoholism, and that total abstinence was what was required. When he would slip, he'd go, oh, I'm a loser, I slipped, and then he would just go on a binge. And right. so you know, the, the AA kind of led him to that. You know, many times when he, he was in jail a couple of times, he'd get out and he, he was going to go on speaking tours for, for Alcoholics Anonymous around the country. That's how much he believed in it and tried it. He tried it many times. He mm -hmm. never went on speaking mm -hmm. tours, but he was always an advertisement for it. He was probably the most non-anonymous member of Alcoholics Anonymous of the 1950s. <laughs> Everybody knew he was part of it. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm like I said, it's it's such a it's such a great read. I, I absolutely loved it, and and I and I understand that your next biography is on uh, Marlon Brando. Is that what you're working on now? Well, it's not a biography. There's been enough biographies of Marlon Brando out there. But True. One, one was about 900 pages that I think uh, my laptop is sitting on right now. But it, <laughs> it's a, it, it's a it's a look at Brando's influence. It'll be out in 2024, which is which would be his 100th birthday and 20 years since his passing about his continued influence on popular culture uh oh great through all these years and so it's yeah it's a different kind of a different kind of book not a biography but just as action-packed i hope <laughs> well I, i'm looking forward to that and just just thinking about brando i mean brando and tierney those two would have been a, that would have been a great pair in a film <laughs> right Ex exactly and again yeah. tierney tierney stepped in for brando uh in That's street right. Desire in in new mexico he got great reviews when the oh, I would have loved to have seen that <laughs> on Wednesday night. Uh, he didn't make it yeah. to the show on Thursday night because he went to the bar in town in, in Albuquerque and oh, God. Santa Fe and did, did not return. Uh, well, whoever saw that show was very lucky, I'm sure, because I would have loved to have seen him as Stanley uh, Kowalski. Yeah. But again, uh, it's out now. Lawrence Tierney, Hollywood's real life tough guy. What a great, I, I suppose you could pretty much get this anywhere. Uh, on Amazon, yes. anywhere. Here it is. Here it's in hardcover. Yeah, hardcover, uh, softcover. Uh, yeah, we we go to um, if you go to lawrencetierneybook.com, there's lots of links. You know, it's on Amazon, and the books signed copies are available at uh, larryedmonds.com. Larry Edmonds Bookshop is on Hollywood Boulevard. I was over there last week. It's it's been there since the 1910s, I think. And yeah. Tierney used to stand. Tierney used to stand on the sidewalk outside the place. And direct people in and say, "Hey, this is a good bookstore. Get in here!" And people were so intimidated <laughs> they would they would go into the bookstore and buy something. So everybody knew Lawrence Tierney in Hollywood.
Fantastic. Well, again, uh, for those of you watching, I highly, highly recommend getting this book. Christmas is around the corner, so it's out now. So go get it. It's a great read. Where, where's the best place for people to follow you on social media, Bert? Wow. Uh, where, where am I? I'm all over the place. Well, there's lawrencetierneybook.com <laughs> on, uh, on Instagram, Tough Guy Tierney on Twitter, uh, Bert Kearns on Instagram, uh, Tabloid Baby on Twitter. And just look up, <laughs> Google me. <laughs> Great. I'm, out, I'm out there. I'm always somewhere. I'll, I'll leave you. the links in the description box below for where, where you can follow uh, Bert on his career and, and what he has next. But again, uh, fantastic book. So, so go get it. And Bert, I want to I thank you so much for taking the time to come out and talk to me today. It was a real pleasure. Oh, well, it's great. Thanks for having me. We'll do it again and, one day. Yeah, please come again where, when you're on uh, uh, the Brando book. I'd love to read that. So hope to have you back. Thanks so much. Take care. I just want to thank Mary and Dorothy for putting me in touch with Bert today and scheduling Bert on my show. Marion is the publicist at University Press of Kentucky. So Marion, thanks so much. And thank you everyone for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever, ever recorded can be found. Go to youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I also wanna thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, Head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.